Hey everybody, Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. Hey, I think you are going to love today's episode. Uh, the live version, of course, is always available on YouTube. So if you'd like to see the live unedited raw version, you're welcome to do that. But if you want to listen to today's more polished show, this is our episode with Henry Langrer. Uh, I'm probably saying his name wrong because it's more of a French kind of pronunciation. Anyhow, Henry's life is impossible. Now, we don't get a lot into his book. His book is called Whatever It Took. Look in the uh, show notes. All the links will be in there. If you're into World War II history, if you're fascinated by the greatest generation, this is a seven star rating on a five star scale. I loved this book. I loved every second of it. Now it's written, co-written with our good friend, Jim DeFelice and Jim, you know, Jim is such a great writer. I've read most of his last recent books and I just can't get enough of it. I, I just love, I love his style. More importantly, Henry's story is insane. You cannot believe that this guy is still alive and that time after time he came upon some kind of life or death challenge and he ended up the guy that survived. It's it's a remarkable, remarkable story. He was a D-Day paratrooper and then things got crazy. So just think about that. His life is, and I've been saying to everybody, it's like a first person shooter game where he's your character, except for he really did these things and is somehow back and has written this story. And I'm so glad we got it. He's well into his 90s. So we are very fortunate to, one, get him live on the show, but two, to have him tell this story because he wasn't going to do it until, you know, finally his family, you know, got him to, to lay down this thing and Wow. It's it's really incredible. Okay. Enough about that. Hey, uh, you all are supporting the show so fantastically. Thank you all so much. I truly appreciate it. I'm doing my best to try to figure out how to get on the road. COVID's kind of slowing that down, but I want to get out and do some unique stuff for all of us. And there's actually a couple of, now that the Prison Chronicles is kind of rounding into final shape, I'm starting to ramp up the pre-production on a couple projects. So here's big things coming. Continue to support, continue to tell friends. And if you're new, hey, Thanks. Five shows a week at least. And really, frankly, we're doing more than that right now with all the lives. We have we have shows lined up until well into July that are already recorded. Either way, uh, Henry's episode is remarkable. You're going to love it. It's going to blow your mind. And I, I don't even want to say anything else. Here comes Henry and his incredible book, Whatever It Took. Lions Rock Productions. <laughs> This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copa. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Henry Langrer on the Break It Down Show. Yeah, this is uh, an incredible opportunity. Thanks, Henry, for coming on. And thanks, Jim, for setting this up. I'm going to let you introduce our guest. Well, actually, uh, I don't. Uh, there's so many accolades I could use. I don't know which one to pick. Henry, let me go with just the simplest one. Henry is a veteran um, of World War II. Uh, jumped into Normandy on D-Day, and uh, like many, like many veterans, is now um, telling you know, uh, kind of trying to preserve his story for future generations. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, a lot of folks left from that generation. Um, but uh, everyone that I've met to kind of paraphrase another the title of another book of mine, or that I had the privilege of working with someone on every one of them is a hero. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, I know uh, Henry will say he's not the hero. He says it in the book and everything. But uh, right. absolutely, these stories are incredible. And I'm so glad that you got a chance to tell it. Uh, because you're not going to probably get a chance to talk the rest of the time. I'm going to ask you a question first, Jim. How did you find this story and then decide that Henry was the guy that you wanted to work with? Well, actually, I can't really take any credit, to be totally honest. The First Army uh, had invited me to um, to participate in their D-Day ceremonies. I believe they probably had an ulterior motive. Yeah. Now, to look at it. They had, uh, well, they had met Henry quite a while. I guess the people there had met Henry quite a while ago. And um, anyway, I, I think I was in town for maybe five minutes and the unit historian, the, and just pretty much everybody from, you know, the, the driver 
to the you know three star general or I forget how many stars, a lot of stars uh, general. They were all kind of working on me to uh, to tell this to help to help tell the story, not not that I told it really. It's Henry's story, and so you know I'd love to take a lot of credit, but I really can't. Well, you'd done the work in the blind, like you'd already done the work. You just didn't know that, you know, this was going to be a project for you. I mean, you have already told Ray's story. All these, you're obviously a great storyteller. You know, all these, all, all these, uh, the interesting thing to me is that no matter I mean, all the stories, you know, the stories do follow some general patterns. You see common themes and that sort of thing. But each man and each woman, too, uh, is individual. What we were very lucky in this book to uh you know to be able to tell some of the home front stories uh, through uh well henry's girlfriend at the time and then she becomes his wife and um you know that i think you know not that that story is totally forgotten but I, that's a really really important part of the story too and what the people back home not just women they were you know uh you know, children, obviously, and older people who couldn't qualify for to, to fight. Uh, but they, you know, they made incredible sacrifices. And, uh, you know, they pitched in. And I, I can't say that they didn't complain, because that's not really real, realistic. There, there were right. certainly some complaints. Uh, but, you know, by and large, you know, you think about it, you're talking, you know, uh, you know, years from Pearl Harbor uh, until VJ Day, which, you know, is in the fall. And, um, you know, and then some of the hardships continue afterwards. So, you know, the country really, really pulled together. You had people from, you know, many, many areas, regions, beliefs, faiths, uh, everything just kind of working together. And, um, and one of the, that's one of the things that's come to me from, you know, from talking to these guys, not, not just Henry or Ray, but some of the other fellows uh, whether in researching uh, or or talking about the book afterwards or the books afterwards, is you know just kind of that can-do spirit, and I you know it makes you feel if these people, if our grandparents or you know in some cases parents, uh, great grandparents in other cases, and great 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 grandparents soon I guess, if they can get through that, you know we can get through whatever we're faced with whether it's a virus or a pandemic or, you know, or, or the normal stuff that we have to deal with every day. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that's, <laughs> that's so true. And actually let me kick the question over to Henry. You know, Jim's talking about the home front sacrifice and Gabby Jurgens is talking about the home front girls here in the chat. And, and it's important to like recognize you come from Iowa and Clinton and you guys were hit really hard by the depression and you were climbing out. But in the book, you talk about how, uh, you know, the moms were working 12 hour shifts at night mm -hmm. so they could get up, get the family ready out the door, you know, rest up and get back there. Talk a little bit about that time, you know, as you saw it and experienced it, even coming back. Like, what was that like for them? Uh, they they lost a lot with food stamps. Uh, they had to have stamps to buy food. They had to, uh, uh, if you need a pair of shoes, you had to turn the shoes in and you had to have stamps to get it. If you had to get gasoline, gasoline was rationed very tightly. Uh, you would uh, be able to get, like my father-in-law was a salesman. He could get five gallons of gas a month. Well, five gallons of gas and those old clunkers that we had, they were gas eaters, you know, didn't yeah. take it very long. And, and uh, they all had vegetable gardens. They called them victory gardens and grew their own vegetables and that and shared them. Uh, because, again, uh, meat was uh, rationed uh, very tightly. Butter, ice cream, almost unheard of. Uh, it. It was very hard on them. They worked very long hours. My wife worked uh, twelve-hour shifts and, and made a in a factory that made machine gun stands. And uh, all of the, her girlfriends did the same thing. Uh, there wasn't too much uh, happiness. I would say, or ferocity uh, for people to. Uh, 
uh, the movies were the big thing. Uh, the movies, uh, for 10 cents, you could go to the movies and uh, really your old attention a little bit and uh, see something on the screen. They always had the news on the screen, RKO, uh, and uh, it was tough for them. It was really tough for them. You know, th- speaking of movies, when The Longest Day comes out, you know, Bob Mitchum's accounted for, Henry Ford is accounted for, John Wayne. But the when you when you saw that movie coming out, did you think, oh, that's that's my fight? Like, what were your thoughts as that movie was coming up? Because you you are in the middle of that movie, basically. Yes, that's right. Uh, well, I didn't know anything about it. We went and saw that movie when it came out, my family and I, and we enjoyed it. It was uh, pretty much lifelike for the time, you know. Yeah. You don't have the special effects and everything that they had, you know, nowadays. But, uh, yes, it was a real surprise. Who should have played you in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Well, I guess anybody could have played the part. <laughs> Jim, who would you cast uh, in Henry's role? I, I don't know. We should point out that the movie is not based on Henry's life. Of okay? course, right, right. But <laughs> yes, yeah. before we get that, uh, uh, you know, I don't. Uh, you know, that's a good question. You mean if we were playing it today, or uh, today? sure, whatever? Like, who would you who who well, characterizes I have to go with Bradley Cooper? I mean, Bradley's uh, Bradley. You know, once you know, <laughs> we'll yeah. try it again. Yeah, and, and um, to be fair, it, you know, the longest day is not made about Henry's life, but Henry's yeah. <laughs> life is in this time frame is absolutely a movie. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Call up every uh, Hollywood producer you you know. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it, it's, um, it, it's, it, it's funny though. We have we're so far now removed from, you know, from World War Two that the way that most of us you know relate to what happened then is through the movies and and through fiction and you know like saving private ryan now there's a lot of stuff i have to say there's certainly a lot of truth in all of those movies and and, and, you know all everything we see there's also the reality and the reality and we try to i think that really is the heart of the book the reality is war is a brutal violent savage thing and you know you yes we it's there are it's necessary that certainly that war was necessary i don't know of any american anyway who can say it wasn't but you have to fight it but you also have to understand that war when people say war sucks they're right it really does henry were you born in 24 Yes, 1924, November yeah. 4th. So, so just to give some perspective, um, the Lincoln Memorial was built about 10 years before Henry was born. Like that's wow. that's how far removed this history is. But but here we yeah. are talking to someone who lived this history. Uh, also, yeah. the Depression. And then what we're, and this is just not necessarily about the book, but what were your thoughts like five years after World War II, your peers are going right back to Korea to go fight some more. Uh, yes, we've had nothing but continued wars all the way from World War I uh, on. And it just, uh, I don't know, it just uh, is, is a terrible thing to see young men have to go off and, and fight. And most of the uh, young men, you know, we were whether it was in France, which we went twice to France to send soldiers over there to free those people over there, and we've been to Vietnam, we've been uh, Cambodia, we've been to all these wars, Iraq, Iran, uh, all all the wars that we've had, these little wars that last years and years and years, uh, they just actually, they kind of wear you down. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. One of the things I recognize in your book, uh, in terms of like, you know, the wars that I was in, the uh, the tension, you know, so for, for those that haven't read the book yet, there's a lot of incredible things in the book and I don't want to spoil it, but at one point Henry is on this impossible escape and just the tension you must have felt all the time. It's very similar to what we deal with here where you're just waiting. You don't know if the bomb is going to get pushed today or the next day or that, but you're always on the road, you know, 
bombs or not. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just, it's horrible to have to deal with that all the time. Yes. Yes. Well, it is. The tension is, it's hard to explain when you're behind the enemy lines, uh, uh, the, the things that can happen to you, the things that you have to do, like the book says, whatever it took, and that's what I had to do. When you're gearing up to go D-Day, you're in the airplane and, and flying. I mean, you guys had a whole extra day to think about this. Like you said in the book, play cards, smoke, pray, read the Bible, that kind of thing. What was that time like? Were you able in any way at all to relax? Oh, yes. I, I played a little bit of cards, won a little bit of money, and uh, had to leave it behind. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a fairly large amount of money at that time, $1,200. You know, wow. that was a lot of money. And uh, I figured I'd send it home, but uh, I didn't get a chance to. I had to leave everything back. They gave us some invasion money, and, and that was about it. You know, the rest of it was equipment. Was that $1,200 waiting for you when you got back to the UK? I don't know whatever happened to it. <laughs> it, it, never, it, went missing, it went missing beforehand. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Not to give, again, not to give the book away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We only give the book oh, away. yeah. Yeah. Right. And Jim. actually, your wife, your, your wife still kids you about that, right? I mean, so she oh, oh, yes. questions whether that really is where it went or maybe you gambled it all somewhere else. <laughs> No, I was kind of tight-fisted. If I won, I left. <laughs> but uh, that's true. Uh, it uh, well, so many things that happen, you know, that uh, you can't explain. You know, I, uh, to your wife? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> what's that? Uh, would you, right, would guys, you say, we'll Jim? Let, let that one go. We'll let that one go. <laughs> I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, oh, that's all right. Yeah. Somebody's yeah, pointing I, out. My wife somebody's saved. pointing out that you could have bought, you could buy, a, could have bought a house in Omaha for twelve hundred dollars in those yeah. days. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Absolutely right. That uh, it's. Uh, my wife worked hard. She saved all of her money. We intended to build a home when we got back. Got married, so uh, she had saved her money, and my money just kind of went down a rat hole. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, you, you decide that you're going to go ahead and just join up so you have some control over where you what you do and where you go. But you end up in uh, the 82nd, or fighting with the 82nd, I guess I could said technically. By the way, I, I, I deployed with the 3rd Brigade of the 82nd in Iraq, and uh, we did some time working with uh, all of their different parachute infantry regiments. So that was uh, that historical link is just incredible when you hear the names of the people and, and you see the poster on the wall. Like, that's that's you. And it's, uh, yeah. it's remarkable to, to experience that. But did you have a pride in the fact that you were an airborne soldier, or was that even a thing yet? Uh, well, yes. Uh, it, when I enlisted in it, I wanted to get in an outfit that was a good outfit, and it was a fighting outfit. And, of course, the $50, that always entered, yeah. entered my mind, too. But, uh, yes, we had uh, uh, a terrific amount of men. We were a mixed group in Normandy uh, from different units, but we all knew what we had jobs to do and we did it. And that was the important thing. Working together, we had wonderful leadership. Our leadership were good officers. They came there and they fought with you. Uh, There was no rear echelon or anything. They were there. They covered your back and that was the important thing. You had to have good men covering your back. What what was your monthly uh, rate? Like, what did you? How much money did you make? I mean, fifty dollars for jump pay, but what was your rate, basic salary? Uh, basic salary was like twenty one dollars at the time. So, <laughs> is that a month or is that a? Oh, week? that was that was uh, regular soldiers. Uh, that was not us. I got fifty dollars, a regular pay. I got fifty dollars overseas pay, and fifty dollar jump pay. Wow. So you were rolling in the dough, huh? Oh, man. Yes, we certainly was. We're sending money home. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Uh, jump pay today is $150. Uh, is it really? Is that yeah. really what it is? That's really, that's all it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, not to turn up my nose at $150. I mean, first of all, it's a lot of beers. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Nothing else. 
Yeah, that that's wonderful. One hundred and fifty dollars. Well, that's good money, I would say. So I'd you're gonna, so I'd you're jump gonna for that. Rest, I think. Is what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's gonna go silent. Yeah. No, I would. Uh, I would jump for the hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> have you? Uh, not to not to take over here, but Henry, have you jumped since uh, the war? Have you, did you parachute ever ever afterwards or? Uh oh, I uh, jumped during the war. Yeah. No, no, I mean after, but after you got out, have you? Oh no, no. no? My, my wife didn't see that'd be a good thing. <laughs> so of course, m- mommy had the word. Okay. Yeah. Any chance of a, a, a late life jump again, like go back next year or heck, even in a couple of weeks, if they offered you a slot in a plane, would you go? I might go, but I don't know that jump at, at my age, I'd probably break every bone in my body. Well, you could use the fancier parachutes now. They'll have a guy <laughs> jump with you, you know? Oh, oh, yeah, they do. I know uh, George Bush Sr. did that. Yeah. He, uh, he, what do they call it? Double up or something tandem. like that. Yeah, yeah, tandem, right? So yeah, that be. I still like to jump, uh, but at my age, like I said, it's yeah. a little bit too late. So, why did you wait seventy-five years to tell this story, man? Well, you know, you'd seen so many bad things, did so many bad things yourself. Uh, you didn't feel like uh, you wanted to open your guts up to somebody else, you know, and tell the story. And I probably never would have if it wasn't for my family. I keep my medal, I had my medals and all that other stuff into a little box, a little box. And kids would play with the medals, take them to school and stuff like that, you know. And uh, then finally, uh, my they were growing up and on the 50th anniversary they said dad what 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 did you do you never ever said anything about the war so i opened up a little bit and then my grandsons uh, three of my grandsons two of my grandsons and a great grandson all joined the 82nd airborne and in the process of joining up they wanted to know a few questions answered you know so we got opened up more and more all the time. And then finally got to be where uh, different groups would ask me to speak at church or at a a gathering of any kind uh, on the TV or on the radio. So um, it it loosened up my uh, thoughts a little bit on it. So, but there are some things that I, uh, I would never ever tell, you know, that still bother me because Again, the title of the book pretty much tells it all, whatever it took. And it took some pretty bad things. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about John Steele, because that's just such an iconic thing. And you guys jump in. And again, we're not getting too far into the book, because I want you guys to really be able to enjoy it. Jim does a fantastic job. But I want to talk to you in a second about the book, Jim, as well. But the um, Tom Steele is he jumps in and if you've seen the longest day he gets hung up on the uh, the steep it's red buttons in the movie, but you you run by him and you're like hey did you know it was Tom or did you not know? Uh, I'm right. in the steeple. So one of the things just to give the audience context the guy that's hanging from the uh, steeple in the, in the church he uh, he survives the war, but like within yeah. a couple of days or right before that, his brother had died in the war. Like this, this war really hit every family in a lot of different ways. You had brothers also that were serving. Did you lose anybody during the war in the family? No, no, I did not. Uh, we was very fortunate no, that uh, no one was killed. Jim, you are a like a cat burglar when you write books. This is what I figured out, right? You you are able to come in and write these incredible books with these authors, and just leave no trace. Like it's like you were never there. You're like you mastered it with. I mean, Johnny Walker's voice is very particular and 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 hard to capture in English because his English is unique. I I forgot that you wrote this book as I was reading it and listening to it. And that is masterful work, man. I just I don't know how do you do that so well. Oh, um, well, the process, I mean, basically, you know, you, you spend a lot of time with the person that you're working with. You know, in Henry's case, we had, uh, you know, we had documents and, you know, background. And actually, uh, Henry, uh, though he hadn't talked about, you know, his stuff, he had actually written 
about it many, many years ago. Uh, so, which actually helped, you know, which helped a lot. And then there had been other research done. And then on top of that, you know, obviously we did research, but most the, the, you know, the, really the heart of it is sitting down and listening. And um, I forget how many days uh, Henry and I spent uh, together. Uh, but, uh, you know, in every book, that's, that's really what, what it, you know, what's involved. You're listening to the person, you know, in the case of Johnny Walker, you're not only, you know, not only having, say, formal type sit down interviews or, you know, you're also having dinner, uh, driving, you know, through the mountains at crazy speeds in ridiculous uh, cars that, you know, are going to go over the edge at, you know, any second. Chris Kyle, Chris and I, when we were working on American Sniper, uh, they actually stayed with us for quite a while. I stayed uh, with there. So you try to get, you know, you just try to spend as much time uh, with the person and, um, you know, and hear their story and then let them talk. That's find a way of, find a way of telling what, they, you know, transforming, I guess, what they say into, you know, into written words. Yeah. Well, you've, you, it's really, it's masterful and everybody can go to Amazon. There's a link on the page here. You can get the book. It's called whatever it took. It's, it's, I, if there's a seven star rating, I'd like to give it that because Henry, the story is impossible. And I'm, I'm so glad that you finally told it. You know, you, you have, you were describing just the every man's uh, perspective from the infantry guy's point of view. And, and uh, I don't know, man, just thank you for writing it because it was, it's such a big piece of this whole thing to see that, to know that it's you times 10,000 other guys immediately in your area. I mean, Think about how a big a division is and how many other guys just like you there are and we'll never hear from those folks. That's right. <laughs> Good yeah. job, Pete. You asked a question where you could say that's right. Too. When you find yourself behind enemy lines as a paratrooper, you talk about having a very specific job and training to go do things. You, did the fog ever clear up for you over time? Did, did combat ever slow down for you? Not really. No, no, it didn't. It's something that you carry in your mind all the time. And uh, it, uh, it lives with you. It just lives with you. Uh, although at times it's like a, a, a woman having a baby. Hmm. You, never, you, you never had a baby, so you don't know what it is to go through it. And that's the same way as the war. It's hard to put into words. And I tell you, Jim is a wonderful writer. He is writing is as smooth as honey. Right. And yeah, and he, he did a good job, a wonderful job, terrific job, taking a, a, a ragtag story and, and bringing it out the way it did. I don't think that, uh, that that'll ever leave me because of the things that you saw and the things that you did. Yeah. They are written on, uh, indelibly in your mind. Yeah. I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Have you been able to forgive yourself for the things that you had to do when you did whatever it took? Not really. There's one episode with a young lady, and I will probably never, ever forget that. You know, and and the other things uh, uh, when you have to kill people with knives and guns and things like that, if you it's close contact, yeah. and, and you see that person's face. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. And, and you see that person's face. One episode, uh, one time, where I had a Thompson submachine gun, and uh, uh, going through the hedgerows, came upon this one soldier. He is left behind, evidently, as a sniper or something, and my gun jammed, and oh. I, I 
was fortunate enough, I jumped down on him and caught him. He had just raised his gun to shoot at me, but it got caught in the underbrush. And I was on top of him before that, and I had to do some terrible things to get out. So, you know, those things, those things never, ever leave your mind. Yeah, that immediate face-to-face -face combat that you've had to endure several times, at least in the book as you write it. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, and it's those things where it's not because you're a better warrior. It's because something snags or you move a tenth of a second earlier or whatever it is. It's not measured in uh, in the quality of the. It's just measured in. Gosh, it seems like it's just measured in luck and in chance. Yes, yes. Well, uh, you know, you you hear so many stories about, and a lot of them are never written. But the ones that that were in combat a long time, and that it, killing got to be just a way of staying alive. I mean, not just alive, but to be there. You get a savage. Uh, approach to death yeah i was gonna you know i was gonna ask you know, i mean one of the things that henry you know henry you told me early on is that you were an atheist during the war and then you had um you had experiences which later on proved to be very important uh, uh regarding regarding your faith and religion although you didn't become more religious, I guess I should say, until after the war, and maybe to balance off some of the some of the negative uh, things there, maybe you might want to mention something along those lines. Yes, that's right, Jim. Uh, those things, like I say, they still bother me, but uh, I feel better about them because I know it was just a. Uh, survival of the fittest, and the, uh, you wanted to survive, and that that point, I guess I will never forget that. But being uh, a faith, I feel that uh, I have had a release from uh, part of that because God has bought it out of my mind. Some of the things, like I say, I don't want to talk about, but God has eased my mind on them. So my wife bought me to Christ, and uh, that was that was a, a, a wonderful thing because I had no faith, I had uh, no purpose in life uh, when I was younger, and of course uh, when I got married, my wife bought me around to Christ, and uh, that was the main thing uh, that helped me through my faith. And my faith bought me through, I would say. And, and she really, she prayed for you uh, during the war. She just had this incredibly positive attitude, it, it seems, that she, uh, even after you, were, you, uh, you, you went missing for a long time, the family received several letters, and then finally uh, a third party, uh, which we're not even sure of which third party it was, but probably it was either, the, it was probably the Red Cross does inform uh the u.s that you're alive but even all through that she kept saying he kept telling people oh no he'll be back he'll be back yeah. and i think she was praying she was praying every uh every night or something is that yes that's right, right. she uh, prayed consistently and she has a great faith and she yeah uh, she's a, just such a wonderful wonderful wife mother grandmother and great-grandmother married 74 years and our anniversary will be the first of july be our 75th anniversary so she put up with me for that length of time so it, it she's uh, just, yeah you might want to keep her she, might want to keep her around you're right i'll keep her around yeah. you bet she's a wonderful wife you know the, the thing is with uh not only you but pretty much your entire generation, you guys come back from the war and you just start carrying on. Uh, you know, you, and again, not to toot your own horn, but you build a fairly successful uh, construction company where you're building a lot of things, including schools, I noticed. Yeah. And uh, what, why, how did you guys do that? I mean, what, what's, you know, what drove you to to then get into business and get successful? And I don't mean just you. Why, you know, the people that oh, come yeah. out across the country. 
Yeah, that's right. Uh, they had initiative. They had uh, a strong initiative. Whatever they liked, they put their back to it. And again, like the book says, whatever it took, that's what they did to have a successful business. We did. We had a suc very successful business. We uh, had very good clients. Uh, and uh, we always finished our jobs on time or before. And so... Uh, our work was always very good, but it does. It uh, you it takes a lifetime to build a business, that's for certain. But after a lifetime, you know, you build a business, and the next generation has some other ideas, and they want to do their own thing too. So uh, I always say, more power to that. <laughs> that's true. Do you hold any uh, ill will towards, you know, the Germans or that kind of thing at all from all the struggling and strife that your generation had to go to? No. Uh, at first, I totally hated the Germans because I saw the things they did. And I, I just could not bring myself to like any of them. To me, to kill one was just, just eliminating another problem on the planet. Hmm. So, yeah, but like I say, my faith has brought me through. And now I, I can forgive all that, I guess, as they can forgive us for what we did. So, but, um, yes, it's, 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 it's hard. Uh, again, like I say, you, you did what you had to do and, right. uh, and to survive. And, and that's, that's the way it was. <laughs> Have you been back to Normandy at all since uh, since the 40s? Yes, my uh, younger son Dale took uh, my wife and I and his his wife over, and uh, the biggest biggest thing of that trip to me was when I went into the cemeteries and I I read the names of the fellows I knew that were still there. Many of the the boys were repatriated back to the United States after the end of the war, but there's still uh, thousands and thousands of them over there yet, and uh, take pictures of their uh, stones, you know, yeah, and reminiscing it. Uh, that helped a lot too, as far as uh, breaking up my memories, the hate and that, that I had to. Why, why did it take going to the cemetery to do that? I mean, you're looking at a bunch of gravestones of your friends. Why didn't it go the other way and, and enrage you? No, because uh, I felt that uh, they gave their lives, young men, 19, 25, at that age, they gave their lives to come over and free a nation, not to gain any territory or any wealth or anything, but to free. And they didn't live a life. They gave that life. I lived that life. I've had 75 years, 74 years of a marriage. That's a wonderful thing. I have four wonderful children, four, nine grandchildren and several great grandchildren. So I've been very fortunate. I've lived the life, but they did not. And that's what gets to you. Hmm. Knowing that they had, they gave it all. You can't give any more than your life. Yeah, that's, uh, it's true. That's all you can give. Would you, uh, would you trade your good fortune and your long life and long marriage to uh, let one of those guys come back? Well, I wouldn't be telling the truth. If I said that. <laughs> no, I, I, I still say I was blessed. The guy had his hand in my life and bought me through. Not yeah. that I knew about it at the time, but he did. What's the highest decoration you got militarily? Did you get bronze star, silver star, and that kind of thing at all? You know what? I never like to talk about medals because I'll tell you what. I know guys that did fantastic things and got nothing. Yeah. And and to me, I was no better than another man that, uh, you know, I, I was wounded. So I got a purple heart, but yeah. a lot of guys, a lot of guys got wounded and died. So, you know, I'm, I, medals to me just don't mean a whole lot. I, I thank you for the, that opportunity that they 
wanted to give you something for your service, but I, I feel those guys that earned a lot more medals than I ever did and never got one. Well, you did some stuff that at least today, if you would have done it, it would get you some medals. So, uh, I mean, look, you you guys are all heroes, and, and you took on a, a fight that was much bigger than anything we faced in this time. Uh, we're so divided nowadays and so angry with one another. You guys managed to get to get, well, obviously you survived the Great Depression, but then you know you go and you take on tyranny of the worst kind with Hitler and Mussolini and, and the crew. What are your thoughts as you look over the last 75 years of, of social struggles compared it to today? Is it is it any worse or any better today? Or what's your sense of, of where we're at? Well, you know, uh, the Bible tells us we're always going to have troubles. Troubles are always going to be with us. And so uh, I, I guess as long as there's somebody out there that wants what you have, you got to protect it. And that's the way it's been through uh, all these little wars, even uh, everything. It's somebody's trying to get something that you have not willing to work for it, but want to take it away from you. And uh, they have to stand up. And our nation has always stood up or twice. They went to France to free uh, the French and, uh, uh, and the people over there. So we've always been a giving nation. And I think even, even today, you know, wherever there's a pro problem in the world, we're out there to help. We send people, we send money, we send equipment. We are always ready to help someone. So I think America is a great country, and uh, there's none like it, none like it. You know, given that we've been in, I guess, uh, you know, various states of quarantine and lockdown and social distancing and anything, everything. I'm, I'm wondering, Henry, if you have some advice that, you know, that you might have for, uh, you know, and I, I think we kind of see, you know, the virus is probably going to be around for quite a while, but uh, in, we're at least seeing light at the end of the tunnel that we're in and uh, hopefully things get better. But maybe, Henry, you've got some advice for us for, you know, for afterwards as we get out of that. I mean, uh, we're beyond kind of the shock and, and awe period. Uh, is there some way of persevering? Is there something we you know, should tell us, tell ourselves? What did you tell yourself after the war to keep, you know, how did you keep going on? Well, uh, Jim, it's one of those things again, you know, I think that uh, when this is all over, we still got all pulled together. There's going to be a lot of things that have to be mended before this country gets back to normal again. I, I feel that uh, it's going to be a big uphill fight, I think, to get our country back and running like it was before this uh, hit us. So I would say as people covered my back back during the war, I want to help people as much as I can now. I, there's going to be more people that need help now probably than ever before. And I think we have to work together on this and uh, help each other. Uh, we've always been a nation to help other people and uh, we're going to need a little help ourselves. Yeah. It's uh, interesting. Your, your battle, your war stands almost exactly halfway between the civil war and modern times right now. And you yeah, know, that's just not that much time when you look back at, you know, when, mm -hmm. when you were a young kid, there were people that were probably alive that are headed just, you know, from that time even. Yeah. It, what are your thoughts historically on on what America is? You know, we're really hard on ourselves. Uh, you know, we're not allowed to be nationalists, that kind of thing. But what are your thoughts on what America means in general? You kind of talked about it a little bit before, but specifically, what do you think of the United States? The United States is the most wonderful nation uh, on this earth. Like I said before, we are out there to help anybody, anytime. Whether, whether it's a hurricane or whatever, floods or whatever, we're there to help people. We've done that throughout the world. Uh, United States stands for freedom and uh, for rights and freedom of religion. 
we have all the freedoms that are registered in the Constitution, and we exercise each and every one of them in our own way. And uh, I thank the good Lord that I was born and raised in the United States. Is is Kay still there? I was going to ask Kay a question if she if she's got a second. Yeah, she's outside on the phone. <laughs> oh, she is. Okay, okay. Well, then let yeah. me ask Jim this question. Jim, tell me why Henry is special. Like, what? what I mean, we've got this unique opportunity to talk to someone that's been through so much. What's well, I think sense? that's right. It. I mean, it's, he is someone who has been through so much, and um, you know, he's a resource. He's a living resource of. Uh, really of doing whatever it took or, you know, really perseverance. And that, that again, you know, talk a little bit about Ray Lambert and every man, a hero, the other book, but also I'll, I'll, I've had the privilege of talking, of speaking with many of the surviving uh, generation, at least the guys kind of East of the Mississippi um, you know, the surviving generation of D-Day and, and that, and they have been through hell. Wow. I mean, you know, they went through a depression, they grew up in depression, they go through a war, a, a, a horrendous war, and then they rebuild the country. And that is an experience, if we can't find some advice or, or inspiration or both from either of those three experiences, let alone putting them all together, or, you know, what else, what else can we do? I, yeah. You know, and something, you know, Henry said about America, and I don't, you know, I, obviously, I, I, people know I wave the flag, so I'm going to be a little bit back off on that. But we're, the one thing I would say, you know, we are always a work in progress. We are making things better. We're, we point out the problem that we have or, or how we don't quite meet that ideal and give us some time. You know, because we're going to we're going to kick butt on that problem, too. So and that, you know, and I think that's the American spirit. And you find that in, you know, it, it, Clinton's actually I was going to say call Clinton a small town. It's in my town. But, um, you know, you find that in you know, middle America, whether it's, you know, in Iowa, upstate New York, downstate New York, you find it in the big cities, in California and L.A., uh, Seattle all across America, St. Louis, I start naming all, all uh, every town will be here for a while, but uh, that's my thought. <laughs> uh, you know, you mentioned something, Jim, that, uh, that I've always felt, and I felt that uh, the Great Depression, 10 years of having nothing, the Dust Bowl and all the rest of it, 10 years of that, I think God was trying to get us in a position and and uh, to to fight this war, I don't think that you could have done that today because we were uh, we knew what it was to be without things, and we knew what things were worth fighting for, and I think uh, God had prepared that for us. Mm -hmm. I really truly believe that, mm -hmm. even though it was tough going through those times. I asked Kay a question uh, off mic when we were working on getting everything set up. And I asked her basically, this is a question I was going to ask her if she was available. You just tell us about your dad. Tell us, uh, tell us why he's great. And, and this is what she wrote. She wrote, my dad is kind, humble, generous, and a godly man. He's always been there for me and was always the first to help others. He is such a joyful person and has such an infectious laugh. He taught me to be a hard worker and to never give up. I'm not just proud of him for what he did 76 years ago during D-Day, but what he has done since then. An honorable man, a devoted husband, a family man, and for that, I am so very proud to call him my father. Mm, that's, uh, she could have written a book. That's pretty good. <laughs> You're right, Jim. <laughs> that's very kind. Of I mean, is there She's a wonderful daughter? Yeah. Is there a better I, legacy to leave than something like that, though? I mean, that's that's what every dad wants to hear. Like, war aside, that's, oh, yeah. that's nothing compared to that. You no, know, no, that's right. And we have three other wonderful sons and daughters. And, you know, they're a blessing to us. They really are. They take care of us in our old age. We wouldn't, wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. <laughs> so, you know. I'm very proud of them. They're all good workers. All have had their own businesses. All worked 
together. Good family, good Christian family, loving, caring, compassionate. If you had a piece of advice for us, some wisdom, because look, we have access to all the knowledge in the world, but we're not great at wisdom. What would you impart on us? Well, and I would say the scriptures. You follow the Ten Commandments, and we will never go wrong. I like it. It's just that simple. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Get into the, the scriptures. Ten- I like it. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Jim, any uh, any final questions or anything at all? I think Henry's pretty much, you know, pretty much summed the whole, summed it all up. Um, so throw it over, throw it back to you. Now that I can actually hear what's going on. <laughs> <Throw it back. laughs> yeah. Well, so we've had a lot of World War II guys on. We had Woody Williams, who's a, who's a uh, Medal of Honor recipient. We've had on Harold Bray, who survived the USS Indy sinking. Uh, we've had on, uh, actually had Sammy Nestico, who's a 95 year old composer who lived through that era as well. Just, you know, a, a ton of, uh, uh, Chet Roan, who was, uh, he raced to the battle of the bulge for his first fight. All of you guys are incredible. Just to a man, you've all been such incredible people and live such incredible lives. Uh, if I could give a stronger, I don't have a stronger rating for the book. It's just fantastic. It's called whatever it took. And you are not going to believe just the the fact that Henry is still here. There's must have been like I always say like Henry in, in my combat time, I've been hit by a tank, hit by mortars, you know, shot at by the enemy, all kinds of things. I must have twenty lives. I I mean I ran way past nine, and uh, you got me beat easy with the impossible like stuff that you survived. So if you guys ever want to understand World War II from another perspective, from the from the ground truth, which you all know I'm big on, you've got to read this book. It's just fantastic. And as always, rate and review it because that's what helps bump the book up in the uh, in the rankings. And this book is it's seriously one of the best books I've, I've read in a very, very, very long time. Well, thank you so very much. I certainly appreciate that. It's very kind of you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank all right, fellas. I'm going to push this button over here. Stand by.